Today I present like a little piece of my research project I'm doing right now about midwives in occupied Poland. So, and I will just jump into the text right now. So after Nazi Germany invaded Poland in September 39, one of the first Reich German midwives to sign up in the, at work in the occupied territories was Marie Bigot. She arrived in the city of Lodz in December 39. Lodz was located in the Reichsgau Warteland, which I show you on this map. Um, the Warteland was like the Reichsgau, Danzig, West Prussia, and the districts of Katowice and Sichenau annexed to the German Reich in 39. Marie Bigot worked in a hospital that was set up for German repatriates from eastern and southeastern Germany and run by the German Red Cross. She experienced Lodz as a hostile and poor and filthy environment. On this picture, you see German midwives on the way to occupied Poland. In occupied Poland, I think <coughs> one of them might be Marie Bigot. In '42, Marie Bigot recalled arrival in Lodz in the Nazi midwives' journal. We drove along the main street. It was horrendous. The street was very dirty, filthy water in the gutter. We drove on and encountered even more dreadful scenes. Filthy Jewish dwellings with Jewish lowlifes squatting in front of the doors, staring at us. Our faces were filled with horror. We finally stopped. We had arrived at a big plain building, the North Hospital. We walked in and our eyes fell on empty and dirty rooms. My goodness. This was where we were supposed to live. And as propaganda accompanied the invasion of Poland with descriptions of poor standards of living, an uncivilized and filthy Polish culture and Poles committing cruel crimes against the German minority. Against this background, and because only Germans mattered, propaganda made the cruelty and violence practiced by the German forces seem insignificant or even, even legitimate, as Doris Bergen and Nicolas Stargard point out. Marie Bigot <coughs> also did not reflect on the violent German invasion and on the suppression of the Polish and Jewish inhabitants of Lodz. Rather, she reproduced and stressed stereotypes set up by the NS propaganda in her field of competence. Despite poverty, and filth, from her point of view, the Vaterland, the city of Lodz, and her commitment to the ethnic German repatriates was a great personal and professional <coughs> opportunity. She was very happy to contribute to Germany's victory. She experienced comradeship and a sense of community with her German colleagues and found fulfillment in her work. Moreover, Nana Conti, we, heard, we just heard about, appointed her chief of all midwives working in charge of resettlement of ethnic Germans uh, to the German Reich. Hence, uh, Marie Bigot became an operative of the National Socialist Midwife Association. So, when Nazi Germany invaded Lodz, the life of the Polish Jewish midwife, Rachel Hirschenberg, was shattered. See her on this picture. Um, Rachel Hirschenberg had been born in Lodz, was 38 years old, married, and had a 13-year-old daughter. She had practiced as a freelance midwife in Lodz since the early 20s. From, her, from the beginning, oh sorry, what I did I do so? From the beginning of occupation, Germans exercised violent excesses against Poles and Jews. Starting in September 39, all Jews had to reg register and wear special symbols, as you know. They also lost their Polish citizenship and became stateless, and also they were ruined economically. Rachel Hirschenberg and her family managed to escape violent attacks during the initial period of occupation. Her twin sister, Anna, also a midwife, decided to flee the city, heading for the Soviet Union. Rachel Hirschenberg instead assumed the war might not last too long and stayed with her family in Lodz. She took over her twins' a job as a hospital-based midwife, which enabled her to earn a livelihood for her family. All of the information about Rachel Hirschenberg was provided by her daughter, Salomea Cape, whom I'd like to thank for giving testimony and permitting me to use it. 
So as the stories of Marie Bigot and Rachel Hirschenbeck demonstrate, the experience of war were very different depending on local settings and ethnic identity. I will focus on my paper on those increasing, increasingly antagonistic perspectives of German, uh, German and Polish Jewish and Polish Christian midwives and try to bring those together within the spatial setting of occupied Western Poland. In doing so, I'd like to make a contribution to what Saul Friedlander has called an integrated history. Maybe we could discuss in the end whether it works this way I did it. And also, I'd like to focus on how what Mary Fulbrook has called systemic violence operates. Mary Fulbrook defines systemic violence as harmful practices related to the functionality of a specific social system. Agents of the system were not just perpetrators in a legal sense, so were those who brought about practices that caused suffering um, indirectly and without being di directly confronted with it. This broaches the question how the Nazi system of exclusion, expropriation and persecution on the one hand and inclusion and the illusion of community on the other mani manifested in everyday life and in my case within occupied Western Poland and within this female dominated sphere of pregnancy and childbirth. In the annexed parts of Poland, Nazis aimed to create new Lebensraum for Germans and to Germanize the country. This included the reorganization of the, popula of, sorry, of the population and social structure under the premise of Nazi race policy. Nazis thereby aimed to shape distinct collective racial and national identities, reshaping individual and biographical identities and setting up a racial, racial hierarchy. How were biographies of midwives changed by Nazi policy and racial segregation? Marie Bigot defined herself as a, as a Reich German and regarded Jews and Poles as aliens she had nothing in common with. So I will just close this one because it's not. Um, according to her report, uh, on for her racial barriers were clearly set. Okay, for people who had lived in Poland before the war, the case might have been somehow more complex. The Second Polish Republic was multi-ethnic and granted minority rights to the Jewish population, which uh, comprised about 10% and the German minority 4%. Despite the limitation of those rights since 35 and also the steady erosion of relations between Christians and Jews and Poles and Germans, there were personal, social and professional contacts between the different groups. The court file of the midwife Rosalie G gives a glimpse on how Nazi race policy afflicted social contacts and identities and also how people try to uh, use those identities to get along. Um, since the 1920s, Rosa Ligue had practiced as a freelance midwife in Katowice, located in Upper Silesia. After the German occupation, the German half administration in annexed Poland favored, as in the old German Reich, a decentralized midwife-led services under the supervision of health officers. In October 1940, the Reich Midwifery Law we just heard about was adopted in the annexed parts of Poland and it restructured midwifery first and foremost, bringing, bringing it in line with race policy. It granted a unique social, economic and legal position to German midwives and introduced the mandatory enlistment which monopolized the authority of midwives. At the same time, the law restricted Polish Christian midwives and deprived Polish Jewish midwives of their rights. Jewish midwives were no longer allowed to attend Christian women. They were gradually separated from their former non-Jewish neighbors. Polish Christian midwives instead could apply to continue practicing until further notice, attending German and Polish birth. As a matter of fact, Polish Christian midwives attended the major share of birth but they had to pay 20% of their income to the German Midwives Association, which used it to fund German midwives. 
However, ever, for, health, uh, for the German health authorities, the application procedure was an ideal opportunity to review um, Polish midwives. Rosalie G. also filed, also filed an application for further practice in summer 41. <coughs> the local NSDAP leader vouched for her reliability and recom recommended registering her in the German ethnic register. The German health officer instead insisted on dismissing her. He accused her of Rassenschande. In 37, Rosalie G. had started a love affair with Wolf G. After the invasion of Poland, Wolf G claimed a being ethnic German. And since he had grown up in Frankfurt, he spoke German fluently and soon got an employment in NS organizations. When he failed to prove his Aryan descent, he was arrested in September 40. The court declared him to be of Jewish descent as his parents were Jews and he himself had converted to prote Protestantism in 33. When Rosalie G. and Wolf G. saw no opportunity for acquittal of Wolf G., they obviously agreed on trying to keep Rosalie G. out. Wolf G. therefore claimed that he had not identified with Jewishness and had never informed Rosalie G. about his Jewish descent. As Berthe Kuntrus points out, German Polish German identities could have been fluid and flexible. But as soon as racial classification and racial barriers were set, they increasingly determined living conditions and survival, though as in the case of Rosalie G. and Wolf G. The German authorities did not follow Wolf G. and Rosalie G.'s argumentation. Rosalie G. was banned from practicing her profession. She lost her perspective of earning a livelihood and was not registered as a German. Wolf G. was sentenced to 15 years in prison since he had caused the German authorities to believe he was German and managed at least temporarily to evade racial classi classification. In January 43, he was murdered in the Mauthausen concentration camp. So we switch back to Lodz. There at Christmas 39, the first trains full of ethnic German repatriates arrived. On this picture, you see a midwife with new, newborns of repatriated ethnic Germans. Marie Bigot felt bad for the ethnic German mothers who had had a long, exhausting journey and were separated from their husbands and families. Shortly before the first ethnic German repatriates reached Lodz, Regierungspräsident Übelhör had ordered the building of a ghetto to isolate the Jewish population of the city, which comprised more than 30% before the war. The ghetto was situated in the northern part of town. Rachel Hirschenberg's house became part of the ghetto. By the end of April 40, the entire Jewish population was forced to move into the ghetto, whereby all Christians had to leave the area. The North Hospital also became part of the ghetto. Midwives from the old German Reich like Marie Bigot became eyewitnesses of the ghetto building and the rigorous race policy. How did they how, well, sorry. Well, how did she react to practices of exclusion or even participated in it? Marie Bigot recalled, we got notice to leave the North Hospital since it was in the middle of the ghetto. It was to be placed at the disposal of the Jews. We all had, to, had nightmares. We were furious. We unscrewed anything that was made of brass that gave us an outlet. You can imagine our delight when we learned that 600 centners of brass were sent to the Führer as a birthday present. Marie Bigot was angry about having to leave the maternity ward that she had set up some months prior to that. She made the Jews responsible for her anger. She and her colleagues materially compensated for their anger. From her point of view, it was completely <coughs> justified for Germans to take whatever they wanted or needed. As much empathy she had have for ethnic German mothers, as little she had for Jews and Poles. She was only focused on Germans. In her point of view, Poles and Jews were the ones causing inconvenience and threat to Germans. As far as it is concerned, Marie Bigot, her work in the North Hospital ended in April, in April 40. The city was renamed Litzmannstadt 
and Marie Bigot went on to work in other maternity wards in town. By the end of uh, April 40, the ghetto had been barricaded. Rachel Hirschenberg started to work in Hospital One. Probably that was the former North Hospital. In Litzmannstadt, ghetto, 25 midwives were registered in summer 1940, as you see on this list. But just three of them were employed as a midwife by the Jewish Council, among them Rachel Herschenberg. Due to the inhuman conditions in the ghetto, marked by starvation, extensive forced labor and deportations to the Kulmhof death camp starting in January 1942, far fewer children were born than before the war. On this picture, you see um, a birth statistic from October. Uh, no, you don't see it. It's on the other presentation. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I have to <coughs> show you later, maybe. Anyway, during the entire time the ghetto existed, um, 2,306 children were born. As Kristina Ratchichevska points out, they were primarily their mother's firstborns. Before the war, four minutes. Four minutes. Oh, I hope I will be fine. <laughs> um, before the war, there had been about 3,000 Jewish birth a year. So, just to compare. The children born in the ghetto had very little chance to su of survival. In fall, in fall 1942, when the ghetto was turned into a labor camp, hospitals were closed and remodeled into workshops. Now Rachel Hirschenberg increasingly assisted in abortion in an abortion clinic. So, now I can show you another picture because this is hospital one, now, how it looks nowadays. Um, when the ghetto was liquidated in August 44, Rachel Hirschenberg and her family remained in the area with about 600 to 900 others as part of the so-called cleaning commando. Salomea Cape, her daughter, describes what it involved to work as a midwife under such circumstances and to give birth when the ghetto no longer existed but those who remained lived in hiding or in labor camp. In late fall, a man secretly came to the camp. He and his wife had hidden in one of the abandoned buildings in the ghetto. He came in the darkness of the night, for his wife was bleeding to death after giving birth to a boy. In a filthy, well-camouflaged cellar, my mother examined the heavily bleeding woman and removed the placenta. She came back beaming with joy and with a loaf of bread. The mother and the baby were doing well. My mother delivered another baby in the camp. The woman was so slender that no one recognized that she was in an advanced stage of pregnancy. The woman's bed was put in a dark corner in the hall of the woman's quarter. I sat nearby and heard a slight commotion behind the improvised curtain, the husband's whispers and my mother's quiet voice. No groan or moan. There were only my mother's quick steps and the later a weak cry, a chirp. Then there was a total silence behind the curtain. In the early morning, there was no trace of the event and no trace of the baby. The woman went to her usual work assignment with a deathly white face. My mother came to me in tears and said, but the boy, the baby boy in the cellar, he will survive. You will see, he will survive. On January 19th, 1944, 45, Rachel Hirschenberg and her family were liberated by the Red Army. However, I don't know whether the baby boy survived. Um, right after the liberation, Rachel Hirschenberg started to work again as a freelance midwife in Lodz. Her sister Anna returned to Lodz shortly after the war. Rachel Hirschenberg died in 1975. What happened to Marie Bigot is uncertain. <coughs> she might have fled the Red Army and left Lodge, as did many Germans in January. However, after leaving Lodge, she never again held a position in the Midwives Association. I come to my conclusion. It was Reich, mit, uh, Reich German midwives in particular who per profited from Nazi race and Germanization policy, as well as from the appropriation that took place in occupied Western Poland. In their sphere of competence, they facilitated race policy and the Nazi system of exclusion. In doing so, 
they were not just witnesses or bystanders, but aided the Holocaust as agents of systemic violence. And I think this underscores Mary Fuhrbrook's suggestion to rethink the term bystanders, since they were often the ones who benefited and also promoted racism and exclusion. Um, the stories of Rosalie G. and Wolf G. and Rachel Hirschenberg, on the other hand, shed light on the impact of uh, systemic violence on the destruction of life planning, on the harm and suffering these practices caused. At the same time, they draw attention to the practices of gaining agency in situations of prosecution and developing individual strategies to escape the regime's seizure and to survive at least temporarily. And so this is what we might discuss if you like to, or, well, I'm really, really unsure about this. Um, so could, is it okay to write a, like a integrated history, history like this, or is it like, I feel I more li uh, um, mainly did like I, I had like parallel stories put next to each other, and I feel that somehow I'm still missing the links in between, and it's so hard to compare those stories because they were so increasingly different. And uh, well, I would be very curious to hear your opinions about that. So thank you, and I'm waiting for discussion. Thank you.